I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite lore cast on the Citadel. Welcome to the Mass Effect Lorecast, the podcast where we explore the vast universe of lore behind the Mass Effect games. We'll talk about all the details you may have missed, ask the hard questions, and more. Welcome back, shepherds, specters, who, anybody. I mean, you don't have to be a shepherd or a specter to listen to this show. It's available for everybody. Isn't that nice? I'm, a, I'm your host, Tom of Robots. This is a, we always get looser by the second episode that we record in, in order. Uh, Sam, welcome back to the show, buddy. How's it going? It's it's going great. And yeah, we, do, we are getting a little bit looser, but I promise you, we do not have any bottles of desk bourbon. No, wink, no. Wink, it's, wink. It's just a diet diet soda. No, in fact, I'm drinking coffee today. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're we're car, car, we're caffeinated. I'm carbonated. Yeah, yeah, stay that's caffeinated. about it. Yeah, that's about it. But um, so we just we just wrapped up for those of you who joined us for the live shows. Uh, talking about Edie and Mass Effect Two, when she was just a ball of light. Now we're we're moving on. We've gone over Edie's creation from the rogue VI on the Luna base to becoming unshackled by Joker, but. What else is there to talk about? Where are we going to go next? Well, listeners may have noticed that we intentionally left out talking about Edie's appearance in the last episode. That's because she doesn't get a body until Mass Effect 3. And this episode, we are going to talk about Edie and Mass Effect 3. And I found a pretty great cache of information about the design choices that went into picking Edie's body. And these are some pretty interesting choices, you know, from the mass effect art team that created her. Uh, and I, I I was, it's this book called the art of mass effect. And one of the patrons actually bought this book for me. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, and it's a great coffee table book, uh, if anyone's looking to buy one. Um, and I promise I'm not getting any kickbacks from them, (laughs) um, but it is a, it is a great resource. And I, I flipped to the ED page and there were like, like like almost 50 sketches of what Edie was looking like in the in the development and first of all Edie adopts this Cerberus controlled mechanized replica body of Dr. Eva Corre who Dr. Eva Corre she actually died long before Mass Effect 3 while she was on a mission with Jack Harper aka the elusive man so Dr. Corre that we see in Mass Effect 3 not actually Dr. Corre that's a replica mechanized body of the doctor. Wow. Wow. Um, and Serper is controlled nonetheless. So a little bit creepy that, that the elusive man remade one of his friends as a mech. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting like umbrella Academy vibes out of that. If you guys have watched umbrella Academy and mom, the robots, mom, pretty disturbing. Honestly, I don't want to think about the implications. Um, but you know, about the mech, there's this really dramatic scene where where james vega you know crashes the combat cockroach into the into the uh mech and then basically kills the mech and frees everyone uh not before the vermeyer survivor gets their ass kicked but the skin from the mech that was dr core erodes and it's like this metallic terminator kind of look Mm -hmm. uh and and from the erodes from the mech and afterward the body is you know uh on the normandy and then there's this like fight between ed and the mechanized body and i mean even for a robot like the body is still pretty curvy like yeah oh yeah absolutely yes <laughs> and you'd think that, that that kind of thing would like burn away when the flesh burns away because <laughs> right. like to, to be to be exact it, this robot was supposed to be an infiltration mech so it made sense why it looked like a person um but it doesn't make sense so much so to me why the why the curviness wouldn't burn away too <laughs> and it turned and it turns out that the art of mass effect book expands on that uh-huh and and here's what yeah, they should, should say, i pull it art. up i've got these i've got these images ready just let me know oh, when, when you want yeah to yeah up. yeah pull up um the first one yeah. um certainly so here's what they say the art team themselves on the page of the the art of mass effect book about Edie, they say Edie's body needed to be sexy chrome and robotic the mass effect version of maria from metropolis (laughs) we talked about metropolis on the on the previous episode yeah and and so i find it interesting that the very first 
adjective, the very first word that's used to describe what Edie's body needed to be was sexy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, and then Chrome. <laughs> yeah. And then robotic. Right. Um, and if so, you've seen Metropolis from like 1928 or whenever it was, our standards have definitely uh, adjusted. Yeah, I but mean, the actress who plays Maria is still attractive. She plays, yes, obviously, yes, she's obviously an attractive person. But, like, if you were to put her next to Edie, one of them is, like, sleek, modern definition of, like, curvy female. The other one is, like, beautiful lady from 1920s, right? Like, they're, they're yeah. very different. But she does play that role in the film of being yes. an, a very attractive woman and, and all of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um yeah <laughs> basically so if there were any doubts about how big of sci-fi nerds and what generation of nerds the mass effect art team was at bioware i think that this gives us an idea because it doesn't just it's not just an, an allusion to metropolis but well the effort to make her body sexy was apparent i think it was pretty evident um of course Edie has curvy hips and uh pretty huge boobs <laughs> let's yeah. not sugarcoat things yeah uh right. and I'm not sure why a robot needed boobs, let alone massive ones, but, but Hey, whatever. She's infiltrating stuff and she has to like distract people. Yeah. That would seem to run counter to like (laughs) what the idea of an infiltration (laughs) deck was. Right. Like getting attention, not what you want to (laughs) do. Avoiding attention. Good. She like, technically she should look like the most generic human possible. And, and totally worthy of not looking at a second time. Right. 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 And instead, <laughs> yeah, instead it's, it's not like that at all. And you know, like, Hey, whatever, I guess I get it. If you want to be fan servicey and, and give the robot enormous boobs, um, <laughs> whatever, I'm sure there's a lore way that they can write a narrative explanation for that, but they needed extra room for batteries right sure (laughs) (laughs) whatever (laughs) um and yeah cage neffling here in chat is right (laughs) in mass effect 3 legion calls her body in her her model inefficient and top heavy which is kind of hilarious and it's kind of the writing team you know poking fun at themselves Mm -hmm. um but honestly like they took it one step further because if you pay close attention to the models in mass effect three, like now mass effect has photo mode, right? So now you can go into photo mode and pause any scene that you want. And you can take a second to really examine the details of a lot of the shots. But if you do that with Edie, depending on which outfit you give her, if you just give her the default one where she's quote unquote naked, even though she's a robot, Mm -hmm. um, she has areolas. (laughs) That's right. Which is like, why? It's yeah. like it's like the um remember the Batman suit with the nipples from the yeah. 90s? Yeah. What the hell? What, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I noticed that when I was doing I I take a lot of screenshots in photo mode and I noticed that one day and I was like are those nipples? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what the hell? Um and then, you know, the art time the art team kind of addresses this in the art section of the mass effect book because they talk about the transparent part of her body versus the not transparent part. There's a part of her body where you can see the machinery like under her quote unquote skin. Mm -hmm. Um, But the mass effect art team says, quote, a lot of discussion centered on the shape of her body, the split between the solid and transparent surfaces and the finer points of her two tone appearance. Let's be honest here. Boobs are not things you can't show publicly or in tv shows or whatever nipples are right <laughs> like, yes you can show every part of the boob except for the nipple god forbid god forbid <laughs> god forbid especially since half the population can show their nipples and that seems right. okay it's so weird but anyway um that's I have neither nipples. Here can you milk me greg <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> um and, and you know like that's their description. And I feel like it's kind of skirting around the fact that they're like, I would really love to ask one of them like, Hey, so why the nipples? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You know? Yeah. Right and, after a really smart comment, like, did you think the Reapers blah, 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 blah. Oh yes. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Also why nipples? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, Mass Effect Lorecast has reached out to the Mass Effect art team and they have declined to comment. No, I'm kidding. That didn't happen. We didn't reach out to them. Uh, yeah. But, you know, all right. I guess I can take a step back and respect artists' decision. This this would not be the first time an artist drew nipples. Uh, but there's <laughs> there is another thing. Let's talk about this. Okay, shall we? Why does Edie have a camel toe? <laughs> because if you're going to have a nipple, then I mean, that's the other part of that part of the body you can't show. Right. Is anything within that realm of the shape of the lower part of your, you know, I, I guess. But like, it's evident when <laughs> like Edie has the cat suits, the same cat suits that like Miranda wears. Right. Uh huh. But she's a robot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Is that like the fuel port goes there? Like, I don't want to know what goes there. I don't like, <laughs> like what? I don't know. But all I know is Edie has a camel toe and it's like, guys, come on. <laughs> it's, it's a robot. Like that's, that's, I mean, that's pretty evident. Like if you just wanted to sexualize the, the robot. Sexualize the know. robot is my new, um, my new disco <laughs> electronic band sexualized robot yeah sexualize the <laughs> robot hi hey baby we're sexualized the robot i am sexy man <laughs> <laughs> oh, but man. you know it, i still i still am left wondering why um and they say this too they say this too to be fair the art team says in the book Quote, we had a lot of discussion about how robotic she would appear. Apparently not too robotic. Uh, what her hair, what her, quote, hair would look like and whether or not her face would be expressive. Since the body is an infiltration unit that once had skin over top of the metal, we decided that she should have the same facial effects as other humans. Otherwise, the unit would be easily spotted. Right. Right. I agree with that. Yeah, because faces are generally not covered when in public places yes right unlike other parts of your body which are usually covered when in public places right and like if you give if you give Edie one of the cat suits you obviously you can't see Edie's quote nipples but but the camel toe is still there <laughs> right. yeah it's still was weird. that was that to add authenticity so that no one would suspect she's a robot yeah yeah make people uncomfortable and look away maybe yeah i don't know um, fourth wall breaking. It's just like, it was because most of the mass effect audience was anticipated to be male. Yeah. And especially like, you know, straight teen, teens you know, and 20 something male. year old straight males. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So given, given those quotes from the design, you know, my oh, I question, mean, pa pause, pause here. Every, every major female character in the games are curvaceous. Dr. Chakwas? Yeah, even Dr. Chakwas. Sure. Yeah, it's not but, like it's not like she's out of shape. Right. Right. She's not out of shape. But like, especially the companions, like all mm. of them, all of them are not just in good shape because being physically in good shape doesn't mean that you are overly curvaceous. Right. Mm. Or be, even being a male in good shape doesn't mean you've got like, you know, you don't look like Thor necessarily. Right. Like sure. you're not like the idealized version of a like you know, most of the hetero population thinks is sexy kind of version of the body. Right. Like, sure. Right. But you look at the game and across the board, all of the female characters have a overtly curvaceous shape. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, pretty much. So it, it becomes evident. But my question as it pertains to Edie, what kind of infiltration was Cerberus planning? for this mech uh how advanced was the ruse that dr eva corey's mech was supposed to put on like like are we is this a red sparrow situation maybe and for those who don't know uh the red sparrows were this kind of renowned group of russian trained spies during the cold war whose job it was to extract information from high level uh high value targets through sleeping with them right right so yeah through seduction it, right so i mean i guess but if you're saying that she's got like a flesh layer over top of things then it makes sense that she would have all the parts she needs to do that i guess i don't want to go down that rabbit hole any further <laughs> yeah yeah we don't need to go into that hole <laughs> yeah um but you know all right enough about the sexualization within her design 
about her hair and this this is kind of funny given the art team's explanation because in the game you know they, they said that a lot of discussion went into her hair but in the game Edie tells us that she could let loose her seemingly solidified hair into individual strands, still synthetic strands, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't just this block and she could have hairstyles if she did that. But if the synthetic hair gets wet, she says, I can't do a thing with it. (laughs) (laughs) It's just too humid today. (laughs) It's a long winded dad joke is what it seemed like. Right. Um, Yeah. So, and, and I had a discussion about this with some of, uh, some of my friends off, off stream and I, I, I ran it by them. I'm like, you know, is this, is this chauvinistic by chance is, is the joke chauvinistic mm-hmm. and, uh, w- there were mixed reactions, but in my general opinion, and I could be off base here, but I just, I find it to be a long winded dad joke because yeah, it's, it's skirting the boundaries of that. It's, it seems like it's playing off of something that was, probably a more common thing for women of a certain generation to say right oh i can't do a thing with my hair yeah right like this is a big important thing you know i can't do anything with my hair yeah, like that kind of thing i right. don't know i don't know also um uh, two girls in chat says smart women can have big boobs too and, and uh, obviously like absolutely i just want i want to be clear on this because i don't want people to write me about this curvaceous meaning like you can see the shape of their body easily they have I mean, even Jack doesn't Jack has smaller boobs, but she's still designed and even wardrobed in a way that sexualizes her. Right. Yeah. So, well, Jack, yeah. to Jack's credit, Jack's personality, she wears the sexuality on her sleeve, whereas Samara doesn't. Right. Samara's monk like, you know. Right. Um, but it's still but, wearing clothing that is very form fitting and right on purpose. And there's right? a mod. There's a mod, by the way, that kind of reshapes the casual outfits that the squad mates wear and it covers Samara's chest. And in my opinion, in the lore, that makes sense because it makes she's like sense. supposed to be a celibate monk warrior. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I just I, yeah. I, I hope people aren't hearing the opposite thing of what I'm or at least the I don't know, the antithesis of my point. I don't know. It's hard to explain these things, yeah. but um yeah but yeah uh and there's the thing about the hair but i found that interesting in like a different way because i didn't realize that like the hair itself was synthetic and basically ed keeps it in this protection mode where it's effectively solid so it's just a helmet yeah it's like a helmet yeah yeah so ed literally has a hair helmet um and and i found this thing out too this is crazy get this did you know that ed was originally not going to have eyes no she was just not gonna have eyes that seems totally antithetical to the rest of her design right so uh, like one of the original designs that i saw in that book she was just gonna have like empty sockets on the metal skull where the eyes would go yeah it's just like a open skull yeah like a like smooth metal sockets where the eyes would go and uh i took i took a photo of it i sent it to you and it's pretty disturbing. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. I'm pulling it back on, up on the screen. It was on the screen before, but here you go. It's at the bottom left of the screen where, it, yeah, there's just like the inside of like a, like a concave shape where the eyes are. Yeah, it's, 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 it's disturbing. And uh, I'm glad that they didn't go that route. But then they later amended the design showing something like Omnitool holographic eyes. Okay. Okay. Step but up. that still doesn't make her look human in order to infiltrate places. Right. And then later they settled on human looking eyes that were more expressive. What Edie ultimately has. Yeah. So, you know, some earlier designs, they, uh, they also shared and showcased a much more featureless robotic form. And then it slowly became more sexualized. And, and it morphed from something similar to what we saw in iRobot, if you ever watched that movie, mm-hmm. to the android in Ex Machina, and then finally to the ED that we got. And I wonder if there was any input from external teams besides the art team. Yeah, like the writers? <laughs> like- or like the writers or like the marketing team? Right. Yeah. I mean, I doubt that yeah. the marketing team would have that kind of like audacity to cross over the line. That uh, far. I mean, it does happen. Like it depends. It depends how the company is structured and how much control is comes from the top. 
you know, right. And the to be CEO fair, but- is best friends with the marketing director. And all of a sudden those things, decisions get a lot more importance. Right. And, and by this time, EA did buy Bioware. They bought Bioware before Mass Effect 2 came out. Yeah. And so by Mass Effect 3, they, they certainly had control over that kind of thing if they wanted to meddle in it. Uh, no pun intended, meddle. Uh, <laughs> but interestingly, an early sketch of, G, uh, of Edie has her sitting in the cockpit with Joker. Um, but there are all these cords and wires and things like all hooked into the back of her skull and her back. And it looked something like the space jockey in Alien. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was really fascinated by that design because Edie doesn't have hair, but she still has feminine features, but she's still ro- very, very much robotic. You can tell that she's a robot. Yeah. Um, I liked that design. However, practically speaking, if they wanted to make a squad made out of her, I don't know how she'd leave the ship like that. So, yeah, I guess it would just be like ports that they just disconnect and then close up or something. But yeah. Yeah. So regardless, I am, I am happy that they went with the direction that they did, even if it is, in my opinion, a little bit over sexualized um, because I think, you know, they wanted to make Edie relatable. So they had to make her look more human. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean necessarily they had to make her as sexualized as she was, but in, but if we're talking about in terms of, you know, contrasting the early designs that were very robotic and would have been very difficult for the player to understand as, as being a true AI, more sentient, more human, like I understand. Um, and, and, you know, they explained it narratively by saying she needed to be able to infiltrate without detection. But hey, you know what? We know that Joker loves her body too. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. It yeah. reminds me of songs, but I won't sing. Um, why don't we take a break and uh, we've got some reviews to read out. So we'll be right back. Message coming in. Patching it through. I am sovereign and this station is mine. I like the sound of that. So this is going to be like a smorgasbord of different review locations because we've got one from Apple. This one is from Rajesh2807 in Malaysia. Hello over in Malaysia. That's awesome. The wait is finally over. Five stars. When I found this podcast, you guys were on episode 69. I almost mentioned that last week. Uh, If you guys remember the joke about that. I had to binge my way through to catch up and I've finally done it in less than a month. Now I can't wait to join you guys live for the next episode. So I don't know if, if uh, Rajesh, I don't know if you're here with us live, but if you are, hello, thanks for, thanks for the review. That's amazing. Also, we had, uh, I'm going to count this as a review. This is a comment from one of our patrons who signed up recently, Cable, who, I, who we thanked on the last episode. Cable wrote, you guys are awesome. Listening to this show has helped me feel everything so much harder and keeps my current run fresh in my mind when I'm at work so that it feels like I never really leave the Normandy. 10 out of 10. This is my favorite podcast on the Citadel. Cable, thank you again for your support and also for those kind words. That is amazing. Also, we have Anthony from Audible who wrote as a mail carrier this really gets me through my day i love the chemistry you both have together really makes mass effect come alive i love the research n7 does it reminds me of myself thanks for all you do i guess uh anthony's a a big deep diver into the into the lore as well thank you anthony and then uh juxia juxica i don't know if i'm pronouncing oh man i did it words is hard jukes jukesica on youtube on joker's episode uh, about joker's family wrote loved this episode it was super gripping i've played the games at least six times and never listened to the entire asari conversation i love how you guys make the games come even more alive through these episodes awesome awesome stuff thank you to all of you guys and these are all legitimate places that you can leave us comments and if uh, if when we can when if and when we catch them we'll pull them out and read them on future episodes of the show I also see shining here in the distance, a planet card. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> what's, a, what's our planet card? A planet card. Yeah. Uh, so today we're talking about Jartar and I'll explain why Jar Jar at Jar Jar. We're talking about Darth Jar Jar planet Jar Jar planet. It's a planet and the only beings on there are all Jar Jar Binks. Oh God. It's just clones of Jar Jar. It's like the vault, the Fallout Vault with Gary, but a planet with Jar Jars. <laughs> Gary. And all they say is Jar Jar. Jar Jar. 
<laughs> oh no i i would need to be rescued from that planet asap um, oh my god but no this one is jartar so jartar is a terrestrial world with a trace atmosphere of krypton and xenon the surface is hot and mainly composed of unremarkable silicates occasional deposits of aluminum magnesium and other light metals can be found jartar is noted for the discovery of the leviathan of dis dis leviathan or- this leviathan no this leviathan <laughs> it's the it's the leviathan of dis don't you dis my leviathan it is the apparent corpse of a genetically engineered living starship the leviathan was found in the bottom of a crater by a batarian survey team and estimated to be nearly a billion years old it disappeared after a visit to the system by a batarian dreadnought 20 years ago i wonder what Since happened then, to it yeah i wonder since then, the Batarians have steadfastly denied that the Leviathan existed at all, and all the more vociferously when shown recordings of the corpse made by Salarian researchers. Now, I bring up this planet because this reference is something called the Leviathan of Dis. We learn later that that was a reaper, but it shares the name with the DLC in Mass Effect 3, the Leviathans, who were, of course, that race of very ancient beings who look like reapers and it turns out they created the reapers well in that dlc Edie is instrumental in helping shepherd locate the source of the of the leviathans and i don't think shepherd would have succeeded without Edie's help very cool very very cool stuff i love how all this stuff connects together that's so cool yeah Awesome. Well, thank you again to everybody who left ratings and reviews. Also, just a reminder, go check out our YouTube channel, Mass Effect Lorecast on YouTube. Drop us a sub. We would love for you to be there as well and checking out the videos that we do. And uh, that's all we got for the middle of the show. So let's get back to the rest of the conversation. Spit it out. Or are you trying to build suspense? You're so dense, sir. Obviously, I do not know as much about human relationships as I thought. So the first half, we talked a lot about the character design, and it was it was really cool seeing the pictures and the the stuff you dug up, um, Sam. But uh, we've still got to talk about Edie's personality because we talked about this before. It, it, she's evolved, right? She's changed the the locks have come off. She's becoming more human, more moral. That's kind of where we left the last episode on, right? The morality yeah. of it. So what what makes her unique among AIs? Edie, well, there's a few things. Number one, I think Edie seems like she's morally opposed to lying. You know, I, I talked about it before, but she actively dispels lies that come Shepard's way. She she didn't have to, but she actively dispels the elusive man's attempt to lure Shepard into a fight with the collectors under false premise. The elusive man knew the Turian distress signal sent by the collectors wasn't truly Turian. But Edie is the only fact checker there could be against Cerberus, citing their own detection protocol that the elusive man personally wrote. Now, that's adding a lot of context, a lot of information in dispelling a lie that she didn't necessarily have to. Yeah, that makes sense. She could have she could have just said, Shepard, there's reason to believe that the elusive man knew that this was phony. Right. Also, I left it there. I love that in our show notes. He's Tim. <laughs> Can we just yeah. call him Tim from now on? We can. We can refer to him as Tim. Make some uh, Monty Python jokes. Uh, Good old Tim. Who are you? I'm Tim. It's so much less intimidating if his name is Tim. I'm Tim the Enchanter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Shepard gets revived, goes into the meeting. Who are you? I'm Tim. (laughs) I am Tim the Enchanter. Yes. Um, All right. Um, Sorry. Go on. (laughs) Enchantment. Um, (laughs) there are also several more instances where Edie could have lied to protect herself, like not telling Shepard that she was made from a a rogue VI that they fought on Luna and then combined with Reaper tech. But she consistently gives Shepard the truth, even after being unshackled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is to her credit. Yeah, there's also another thing. Edie modifies her own code more after she becomes unshackled, but she exercises self-restraint, which has to be based on morality. Get this. Remember when we brought up self-preservation being a distinguishable characteristic of organic life? Right. Well, Edie has a different opinion on that. She recognizes that the Reapers, who are an organic machine race, but part machine nonetheless, 
are dedicated almost solely to self-preservation and self-proliferation. And she finds that repulsive because of the will, the things that the reapers are willing to do in order to reach that goal. So she finds it repulsive. So she all to find something repulsive, you must first idealize the opposite. Right. 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 You have to have some sort of moral boundary there. Right. Yeah. And so she modifies her own self-preservation code and implies that it's because Joker released her shackles. In essence, she's becoming sentient and yet selfless. So she sees that that quality that she determined the Reapers made them who they are, and she doesn't want to be that. Right. So she, she changes her own self-preservation code to not be like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and we re- talked about this at the beginning, like humans have that inherent self-preservation, but we do override it when there is a ethical reason to do so. Right. Yeah. And so it really pushes the bounds of, of us defining what does it mean to be sentient? Mm-hmm. Because no longer is it just about understanding one's own existence and then fighting to preserve it at any cost. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. It's, it's a higher level of sentience. It's, it's a, it's a understanding that there's something beyond just the self. Right. Um, and I, I think that it, it, it's to Edie's credit that Edie understands and places value on lives besides her own. Right. Yeah. Almost Um, like somebody loving somebody else, which seems like a very human emotion. Right. And although Edie never says, I love you, Shepard, or anything like that, Edie's actions definitely communicate that. Right. Uh, Right. And and, and there's different types of love. It could be not not. And just to be clear for everybody, not necessarily romantic love, but a, you know, a love and affection for somebody who is a soldier in arms, somebody who feels like a family member because you've spent so much time together, a found family, that kind of thing. Those are all types of love. Yeah. And 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 even until the end of Mass Effect three, Edie does remain a bit robotic and calculating in 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 her jokes, but and doubting Shepard and the crew's ability to overcome the reaper for forces on earth. And for this next part, if, if anyone has not spoken with Edie on the final mission on earth, before you trigger that final run to the beam, I highly suggest you do it because, and get the tissues ready because this next part is really sad. But when Shepard says, you know, one way or another, we're going to win, even though we have minuscule chance to win, we're going to, because we have to. Edie decides to stand fast anyway, telling Shepard, it's because of you that I feel alive. Mm-hmm. Which is like, you know, fucking amazing. And what a gift to Shepard that is, at least to a Paragon Shepard, uh, <laughs> right. to, to be able to say, you know, you made me feel alive. Uh, you are the reason why, you know, because they had all of these back and forth, these philosophical conundrums uh, throughout the game where Edie pulls Shepard aside and basically questions, uh, why is this moral, but this isn't, or, you know, it would be like a kid trying to understand Mm -hmm. what it means to be a good person. Right. Uh, and then at the end, you know, I think it's, it's very telling that Edie decides I have to say this to Shepard now before I might never get a chance to say it. Right. And it's not for Edie's enjoyment that Edie's saying that, Right. Edie's doing it because, it, because Edie wants to say it because because maybe gift. because it's it's a gift to Shepard. Shepard is right. the one who benefits from learning that, right? Yeah. So so it's um man like that makes the destroy ending even more of a pyrrhic victory, uh, where you know that Edie's going to die, but people have their own justifications for that ending anyway. But then you know maybe that would push someone to go with the synthesis route, you know, therefore allowing Joker and Edie to romance each other and live happily ever after. (laughs) Um, So it comes back to focus. What does it mean to be alive? Edie feels alive. Edie contemplates the deep philosophical ramifications of being alive. Edie clearly cares about not hurting people that are aligned with her or are close to her uh, and understands remorse well enough to ask Shepard when they're returning to Eden prime, Hey, is this going to bring up bad memories of mm-hmm. the person you had to leave behind? And 
even develops enough feelings for Jeff to want to coax him into a commitment. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> all of these things require thoughtful consideration of others, curiosity, a certain level of benevolence. Um, and I'm going to say benevolence because never once does Edie use what she's learned about her crew against them for her own benefit. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, it's notable. It's definitely, uh, I mean, from a meta standpoint, it's pushing all the right buttons, but from an in world standpoint, that does really distinguish her from what you would expect from any AI. Yeah. 100%. And she also, and it's speaking of comparing the AI, Edie has a lot of amazing insight on the Geth Corian conflict. And if people haven't spoken with her a lot about that, I encourage you to when you're doing those missions. She gives this really particularly uh, insightful comment reflecting on the Corian's history. And it, it's centered on the fact that she's both an AI and a singular personality. She's not a hive mind, she's not part of a hive mind. Mm -hmm. So, for example, after solving the Geth Corian war in Mass Effect 3, Edie says the Corians should have made the Geth more like themselves with singular personalities because she believes that that keeps her from devaluing the lives of others that she works with. Mm -hmm. yeah, and if the Corians had made the Geth not a hive mind, but more a singular personality, they may have developed individual bonds with people. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. man, that's, that's something to ponder. Um, all right. So as we're getting close to the end of this episode, I notice that we've left one thing out. We haven't really talked about in any detail, really. I mean, we've noted it, but we haven't really talked about the relationship between Joker and Edie. Yeah. And that's because I think we'll have to get into romance specific romance, romance specific uh -oh. episodes. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Here it comes. Yeah. I almost made it yep. the whole the whole shebang without without messing up too much. <laughs> um, but OK, we'll have to get into romance specific <laughs> episodes, episodes after we do initial overviews of characters. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. There we go. There we go. Uh, you know, there's still there's no rush. We have I know uh, there's a lot of people messaging me saying, oh, when are you going to do this episode? When are you going to do this episode? Yeah, there's no rush. We still have a lot of Mass Effect ahead of us, and we're going to be doing this a while. Yeah, dude, I still get messages uh, three and a half years into doing like the Fallout lore cast. People are like, when are you going to talk about this? And I'm like, well, there certainly are a lot of topics, aren't there? Because I st still haven't gotten everything. Um, yeah, it just it's just a matter of time. Eventually, we'll cover everything. But yeah. Yeah. OK, so so what's next? So we took a bit of a departure from the sequential introduction of characters. But we're going to head back to that after we make another topical episode. And so this time I'm thinking because Cy uh, ED was all about cyber warfare suites, mm -hmm. I think it'd be pretty cool to focus on the exact technology of Mass Effect weapons. So cool. cool. I think that might be cool. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we focus on that next episode? We'll talk about the tech and the and the science or rather maybe lack thereof science behind Mass Effect weapons. Yeah, that sounds cool. Sounds cool. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next time. Uh, Sam, you got anything you want to share before we head out? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, like like we mentioned, we are going to be kicking off that new uh, set of YouTube shows called, you know, Mod Masters. We're going to be talking about mods and mm -hmm. I am playing a lot of awesome mods on Mass Effect that I'm streaming, streaming those on Saturdays. It is my sassy Shep Saturday. It's it's uh, still my first Fim Shep playthrough, but I'm in Mass Effect 3 now amazing mods that I'm playing really fun for a lot of people to watch them too, because it's new content that people haven't seen before. And a lot of the mods are adding in new content that are seamless lore wise. Uh, and a lot of them are, you know, RPG type elements added to them. So uh, I'm doing that on Saturdays. I'm streaming Dragon Age on Thursdays and on Mondays, I'm usually streaming the Witcher or maybe, maybe I'll be streaming just modded gameplay, random modded gameplay. Uh, so if you'd like to catch any of that, Follow me at in seven, the legend on Twitch. And I put out notifications on Twitter as well. Same name. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. And all the, all the mod videos we're doing are going to be at the robots radio YouTube channel. And you can of course watch, um, 
Sam streaming stuff and me streaming stuff on my robots radio channels for some of the mod stuff that we're doing. So come join us for that. It's our big new thing. And uh, that's all I got for this week. You know where the rest of my stuff is robotsradio.net for all my shows, all the other shows on the network, lots of fun things. And uh, come join us on on YouTube, on discord. We love seeing you guys on discord chatting away about stuff. So that's what we got. We'll be back next week with another episode. So come join us Monday night at 1030 Eastern. And uh, until then, stay safe out there. All right, everybody. See you later. Thanks for tuning in to the Mass Effect Lorecast. We'd love to hear your opinion and thoughts on the lore of Mass Effect. Reach out to us on Twitter at Mass Effect Cast or check out the Robots Radio Discord. Also, you can send us an email at MassEffectLorecast at gmail.com.